I've spoken about my work in many countries around the world, including many in this area. Uh, my book, The Hidden History of the Human Race, presents archaeological evidence for extreme human antiquity. Uh, most scientists today and believe that human beings like us evolved from more primitive ape-like creatures and that human beings like us came into existence between 100 and 200,000 years ago. Uh, most scientists say that uh, life began on Earth about two billion years ago. They say the first apes and monkeys came into existence about 40 million years ago. They say that the first ape men came into existence about 6 million years ago. And, you know, they say that human beings like us, modern human beings, came into existence between 100 and 200,000 years ago. And uh, these scientists say that all of the physical evidence supports that idea. But when I did eight years of research into the entire history of archaeology, I found something quite different. I found that over the past 150 years, archaeologists all over the world have found evidence that human beings like us have existed since the very beginning of the history of life on Earth. And many people ask me, well, why did I do this research? It has to do with my studies in the ancient Sanskrit writings of India. Among these writings are a group called the Puranas, or the histories. And these histories, written in the ancient Sanskrit language of India, tell us that human civilizations existed long ago. Uh, they tell us that humans, like us, have existed since the beginning of the history of life on Earth. And uh, this is information that we find not only in the ancient Sanskrit writings of India, but also in the writings of other great religions of the world. Uh, we find this message in the Bible, we find it in the Quran, we find it in practically all of the religions of the world uh, that humans have been here since very, very ancient times. So I thought if there's any truth to what these ancient writings are telling us, there should be some physical evidence to support it. So I thought if there's any truth to what these ancient writings are telling us, there should be some physical evidence to support it. But when I looked in the textbooks of archaeology and history, I didn't find any such evidence. But I didn't stop there. I thought, let me look into the whole history of archaeology. So I began to study uh, archaeological reports in many different languages from many different parts of the world, uh, not just from today, but from earlier times in the history of archaeology. And what I found is very amazing. I found that archaeologists all over the world have found much evidence showing that human beings like us have existed for many millions of years on this planet, going very, very far back in time. You know, if we look at archaeology as a big museum, we find that people are only allowed 
into one small room of that big museum. And there they see only the discoveries that go along with the current theories that humans like us came into existence only 100 or 200,000 years ago. But there are other rooms to that big museum of archaeology, rooms with locks on the doors. And what I've tried to do in my work is take the locks off the doors and let people see uh, what's there. And what's there is this. There are many discoveries of human skeletons, human artifacts, and human footprints going back tens of millions, even hundreds of millions of years. Now this evidence is not very well known to either scientists or the people in general because of what I call a process of knowledge filtration that operates in the world of science. <clears throat> Reports of discoveries that conform to the current theories pass through this intellectual filter very easily. And that means students will read about this evidence in their textbooks, People will see scientists talking about it on television. And if they go to the museum, they will see the discoveries on display. But if we have reports of evidence that radically contradict the current theories, they are filtered out. And that means students will not read about this evidence in their textbooks. People will not see scientists speaking about it on television. And if they go to the local museum, they won't see these discoveries, even though they may be there somewhere in the museum. Now let me give one or two examples of the kind of evidence that I'm talking about. In the 19th century, gold was discovered in California, and miners came from all over the world to get this gold. To get the gold, they dug tunnels into the sides of mountains through the solid rock. Deep inside these tunnels, they found human skeletons, not those of eight men, but of humans like us. They also found many human artifacts, stone mortars and pestles, obsidian spear points, and other human artifacts. Now what makes these discoveries so interesting is that they were found in layers of solid rock belonging to the early part of the geological period called the Eocene. And that means these human bones and human artifacts are 50 million years old. Now for uh, someone who understands the information contained in the ancient writings of the world, such as the ancient Sanskrit writings, this would not be surprising to find evidence that humans were existing on Earth 50 million years ago. As a matter of fact, someone familiar with these ancient writings would expect to find such evidence going much further back in time. But for many archaeologists today, it's completely impossible. Uh, according to their theories, to have human beings existing 50 million years ago. Uh, 50 million years ago is, according to their current way of looking at the history of life on Earth, quite impossible. 50 million years ago is before the time of the first apes and monkeys, according to their current way of looking at the history of life on Earth. Now these California gold mine discoveries were reported 
to the scientific world by Dr. J. D. Whitney. He was the chief government geologist of California, a very famous scientist, and his report was published by Harvard University, one of the top universities in the world. But we don't hear very much about these discoveries today because of this process of knowledge filtration. The scientist most responsible for the knowledge filtering in this case was Dr. William Holmes. He was an anthropologist working at the Smithsonian Institution in Washington. And he said, if Dr. Whitney had understood the theory of human evolution as we understand it today, he would not have announced those discoveries. In other words, if the facts did not go along with the accepted theory, then those facts had to be put aside and the person who reported them had to be discredited. And that's exactly what happened in this case. And that's just one discovery, one example of how this knowledge filtration process works. There are many more discoveries showing human skeletons hundreds of millions of years old, human footprints hundreds of millions of years old, and human artifacts hundreds of millions of years old. So this evidence contradicts the current theories of human origins. And this means we need a new explanation for human origins. Now in my book, The Hidden History of the Human Race, I don't give any alternative explanation because I wanted people to be free to look at this evidence themselves and think about it and come up with their own explanations. But I saved my explanation for another book that I have just published. It's called Human Devolution, a Vedic alternative to Darwin's theory. And the basic message is very simple. We don't evolve up from matter, as most scientists now tell us. Rather, we have devolved or come down from a level of the cosmos dominated by pure consciousness or spirit, if you like that word. Uh, in this book, I propose that before we even ask the question, where did human beings come from, we should first of all ask the question, what is a human being? Today, many scientists will tell us that a human being or any other living thing is simply a combination of the ordinary material elements. They'll tell us that's what we are, a very complex organization of matter. Now, I believe, however, that if we look carefully at all of the evidence that comes to us from various fields of scientific investigation, we will see that it's more reasonable to say that a human being is a combination of three things. Ordinary matter, yes, that is part of what a human being is. But beyond that, there is a subtle mind element. And beyond that, an element of consciousness. And when I speak of mind and consciousness as elements, I don't mean temporary byproducts of bioelectrical activity in the brain. I mean that mind and consciousness are elements in themselves that can exist apart from ordinary matter. And there is scientific evidence for this, but just as in the case of the archaeological evidence, there has been a lot of knowledge filtration going on so that 
many scientists and people in general are not aware of this evidence. Let's look at the evidence for a mind element. I think the first thing I should do is offer a definition of mind suitable for scientific investigation. For that purpose, I define mind like this. Mind is a subtle material element associated with the human organism that can act on ordinary matter in ways that we cannot explain by our current laws of physics. And there is scientific evidence for this. Let me give an example. Every physics student learns about the work of Marie and Pierre Curie. They were husband and wife. They both received Nobel Prizes in physics for their work in discovering radium. You find this in every physics textbook. What you do not see in the textbook is that the Curies were involved in research into the paranormal. Actually, they were part of a group of 20 prominent European scientists who were conducting such research early in the 20th century in Paris. This group of scientists, which included five Nobel Prize winners, including the Curies, conducted two years of research with the Italian medium Eusepia Palladina. Now, medium is a person who possesses paranormal powers. This woman had powers of psychokinesis, the ability of mind to move matter. The experiments were conducted in the Psychology Institute in Paris. On one occasion, the medium was seated in a chair in the laboratory. Marie Curie was controlling her hands. Other scientists were controlling her feet to make sure that she was not moving at all. In the middle of the room, in broad daylight, Pierre Curie, the Nobel Prize winning physicist, said that a large table was floating in the air. He was very carefully measuring how high it was floating in the air, about one meter high, and he was very carefully timing how long it was floating in the air. After the entire two years of experiments, the group of scientists signed a document saying the phenomena were true. Pierre Curie's research notes are still in the science archives for anyone to study in Paris. And he wrote letters to his prominent physicist friends saying these things are absolutely true. We have to take them into account if we are going to have a complete picture of reality. And such experiments are going on even today. For example, Robert John, the head of the engineering department at Princeton University in America, has done experiments with random number generators. A random number generator is a computer-like machine that will generate an output of a random series of zeros and ones. If you let the machine run by itself, it will generate 50% ones and 50% zeros. But John recruited students from Princeton University to sit in front of the machines and will with their minds that, for example, the machines would produce more ones than zeros. And he found they were actually able to do it. They were actually able to cause the machines simply by willing with the mind to produce more ones than zeros or more zeros than ones. The experiments have gone on for over 10 years with millions of trials and hundreds of subjects. And it is a genuine effect. So what does it mean? To me, 
all of this is evidence for a subtle mind element associated with the human organism that can act on ordinary matter in ways that we cannot explain by our current laws of physics. So if we're going to talk about human origins, we have to consider not just the material elements that are part of the human organism, we also have to consider this mind element. Now, what about this element of consciousness? Is there a conscious self that can exist apart from the body, apart from the brain? There is some scientific evidence for this. It comes, for example, from medical reports of out-of-body experiences. There are times when a person should be completely unconscious. For example, during a heart attack, blood stops flowing to the brain. Medical instruments show that the brain waves cease. Yet some people in this state report separating from their bodies and looking down and observing what the doctors and nurses who are trying to revive them are doing. The American heart surgeon, Dr. Michael Sabum, studied this phenomenon. He tried to find a method for telling whether or not these people were speaking the truth. He compared their reports of their out-of-body experiences to their actual medical records, to the notes taken by the doctors who were treating them. And the patients do not see these medical records. He found that the reports they gave exactly matched the reports written by the doctors who were treating them. So he took this as evidence that these reports are true and that there is a conscious self that can separate from the brain during these moments of crisis. Now the idea that there is a conscious self that can temporarily separate from the body and then re-enter the same body leads to another idea. And that is the idea that a conscious self can leave one body and then enter a completely new body. This is the idea of reincarnation or transmigration of the self, the soul. And there is a body of scientific evidence that supports this idea. It comes from psychiatric studies of past life memories. The American psychiatrist, Dr. Ian Stevenson of the University of Virginia Medical School has studied thousands of cases of past lives reported by young children, three or four years old. He likes to deal with young children because an older person could go to a library or go on the web and get enough information to manufacture a convincing past life story. But these young children can't do that. So his method is to carefully interview the child who reports the past life to get every possible detail that the child remembers. In hundreds of cases, Stevenson and his co-workers have been able to verify the existence of the person the child claims to have been in the past life. So there is scientific evidence for a conscious self that can exist apart from the body. So if we want to talk about human origins, if we want to explain where human beings came from, we have to consider not just matter, but matter, mind, and consciousness. We have to explain where all of these things came from and how they came together in the human form.
Now the idea that a human being is composed of matter, mind, and consciousness leads to another idea. And that is, we live in a multi-level cosmos. We live in a cosmos with each level dominated by a different one of these three elements and inhabited by beings adapted to the conditions there. And this was an idea that was very common in Europe among the leading philosophers and scientists until just a few centuries ago. They believed there was a level of the cosmos dominated by ordinary matter and inhabited by beings adapted to the conditions there. That's the level where we now find ourselves. Beyond that, they believed there was a level of the cosmos dominated by the subtle mind element and inhabited by beings adapted to the conditions there. Uh, you can call them astral beings or spirits or gods or goddesses or angels. Uh, and beyond that, they believe there is a level of the cosmos dominated by pure consciousness or spirits. And this is an idea that we find in many of the great wisdom traditions of the world and there's scientific evidence to support it. So I propose that we begin our existence at that topmost level of the cosmos, the level of the cosmos dominated by pure consciousness or spirit. And it's possible to remain there, but if a conscious self becomes attracted to the lower energies of mind and matter, it descends into them, it goes down into them and becomes covered by them. So this process by which a conscious self descends into these lower energies and becomes covered by them is what I call devolution. In other words, we do not evolve up from matter, as many scientists now believe, but rather we devolve or come down from this level of pure consciousness or spirit but it is a process that can be reversed. It is possible to restore consciousness to its original pure state. And every great spiritual tradition of the world has some process of prayer or meditation or contemplation or yoga that is meant to help us do that, restore consciousness to its pure state. And here I'm talking about real processes that work. Just like a geologist can tell us how to extract the pure element gold from its ore where it's mixed with other less valuable metals. Once you've extracted the gold, you can turn it into coins and you can stamp the coins with the symbols of different nations. But if it's really gold, it doesn't matter what symbol you have stamped on it. If it's really gold, it will be accepted everywhere. So in the same way, if by these spiritual technologies we can extract the pure element consciousness from its covering elements, then it doesn't matter what you call the process. You could call it Hinduism or Christianity or Islam, but if it, if it really works, if you are actually able to extract the pure element consciousness, then it will be accepted everywhere. Uh, it, it, it won't be a, 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 it won't be a source of conflict as we sometimes see in the world today. Now these are not just some abstract questions for a few philosophers and scientists to speak about in their ivory towers. These are questions that affect the lives of all of us. It works like this. 
the goals that we set for ourselves individually and collectively are determined by the answers that we give to the very important questions, who am I and where did I come from? For example, if I think I'm an American from America, I will behave in a certain way. Now for the past 100 years or so, the scientists have been giving very materialistic answers to these fundamental questions. Who am I and where did I come from? They've been telling us we are simply combinations of matter. We are simply bags of chemicals. Therefore, it's no surprise that our whole worldwide human civilization has become very materialistic. So much so that most people in the world today believe there is no other purpose in life than to produce and consume more and more material things. And this has become a great cause of conflict in the world today. Now, what would happen if we had a different set of answers to these fundamental questions, who am I and where did I come from? What if we were being told we are beings of pure consciousness? We would be putting more of our human energy into developing the resource of consciousness rather than the resource of matter. Now I'm not saying that we should give up all of our efforts to uh, develop the material necessities of society, but it's a question of balance. For example, if we eat too much of the wrong things, we find it's bad for our health. We don't feel as well as we should. We are not able to act as efficiently as we should. But the solution is not to stop eating. The solution is to eat the right amounts of the right kinds of things. So in our world today, we have the wrong balance between the material and the spiritual. I think we need to restore a proper balance.